Hello to all physics and physical experiment enthusiasts, as well as astronomy fans, because today's video will be dedicated to astronomical matters, and we will discuss the pressing question of whether the days we consider the same are actually the same. First of all, I must say that I will not be considering the slowing of Earth's rotation due to tidal effects, which occur over millions, tens, hundreds of millions of years. Everything we will discuss concerns the change in the length of a day over the course of one year. First of all, we need to make a basic distinction between sidereal days and solar days. And we will start with sidereal days. They are defined quite simply. It is the time it takes for the Earth to make one rotation relative to the starry sky. And if the Earth's rotation is uniform, then all the stars, sidereal days, of course, will be equal to each other. And now we begin the discussion about solar days. Well, to start with, I will assume that the Earth's orbit is circular with the Sun at the center. Here I have placed the Earth and I have drawn this radius to show that if we are standing on the equator at this point, the Sun is exactly above us, directly overhead at the zenith. And then the following happens. The Earth moves along its orbit and rotates. Let's say it has completed one rotation and relative to the starry sky. That is, one sidereal day has passed and it has shifted. But since it was exactly one rotation, this line extending the radius will now be parallel to the original. But we see that the sun is still not at the zenith for the sun. To reach the zenith, the Earth needs to move a little further along its orbit. Some time will pass and it will rotate slightly. And now, we extend the radius go, and it points to the sun. So here we have another small angle. I'll denote it as alpha. It will be useful to us later. This angle shows us how much longer solar days are compared to sidereal days. And here, of course, we need to mention what we all know, that there are approximately 365 solar days in a year. And a quarter, and since sidereal days are shorter, there are accordingly 366 and a quarter well, this difference of one day accumulates precisely due to the orbit around the sun. In the picture I just drew, the solar days turned out to be all the same, although longer than the sidereal days. But in reality, the length of solar days changes throughout the year, sometimes becoming slightly shorter, sometimes slightly longer. And there are two factors responsible for this. The first factor is that Earth's orbit is not circular, but elliptical. And although the eccentricity of this ellipse is small, it is still enough to slightly change the length of the day. The second factor is that Earth's axis is tilted relative to the plane of Earth's orbit by degrees. And this tilt also affects the length of the day throughout the year. Let's first consider the effect related to the ellipticity of Earth's orbit. I have drawn the ellipse exaggeratedly elongated, depicted the Sun, and two positions of Earth. In perihelion on January 3rd, it is closest to the Sun, and in aphelion on July 3rd, it is farthest from the Sun. And we must also remember that in perihelion, Earth moves along its orbit the fastest, and in aphelion the slowest. Now let's see what happens after one sidereal day has passed. At this moment, the corresponding radii, as mentioned earlier, are directed parallel to the original ones, and the Sun has not yet reached the zenith. And for the Sun to be at the zenith and for it to be noon, Earth must move a little further along its orbit and rotate by a certain angle. In perihelion, I will denote this angle as alpha. And the opposite angle is also alpha. And in aphelion, I will denote these angles with the letter beta. And we see that the angle alpha is greater than the angle beta. But it is precisely the magnitude of this angle that characterizes how much longer the solar day is compared to the sidereal day here. It turns out that the solar day in perihelion is longer than in aphelion. In general, the days are the longest in the year at perihelion and the shortest at aphelion. Now let's see how another factor, the tilt of Earth's axis, affects the length of the solar day. 
I thought for a long time about how to depict this, and I decided not to draw either the Earth or its axis. Instead, I drew two hemispheres of the starry sky and the annual path of the sun among the stars, which is called the ecliptic. The sun emerges from the point of the vernal equinox on the celestial equator, rises higher to the point of the summer solstice, then descends to the point of the autumnal equinox, descends even lower to the point of the winter solstice, and completes its annual path by rising to the point of the vernal equinox. And it's important to understand that the sun moves along the ecliptic at a constant speed. If, of course, we disregard the ellipticity of Earth's orbit, and we can disregard it, since we have already accounted for its contribution in the first consideration. Now look. The starry sky makes one complete rotation in one day. Let's assume that the sun was at the point of the summer solstice. In a sidereal day, this point will make one rotation and return to its original position. But during this time, the sun will have already moved along the ecliptic. And for solar noon to occur, the celestial sphere will need to rotate by a certain angle between two meridians. Now let's consider the sun at the position of the vernal equinox. In a sidereal day, it will move along the ecliptic the same distance. But because the ecliptic is inclined to the equator here, the angle of rotation of the celestial sphere before the completion of the solar day will be less here. Thus, at the points of the summer and winter solstices, the contribution it of this effect to the lengthening of the solar day compared to the sidereal day will be greatest, and at the points of the vernal and autumnal equinoxes, this contribution will be the smallest. And now we need to talk about what both of these effects provide in quantitative terms. And so if the second effect of the Earth's axial tilt did not exist, then the first effect related to the ellipticity of the Earth's orbit would result in solar days at perihelion being 16 seconds longer than solar days at aphelion. Similarly, if there were no effect of the ellipticity of the Earth's orbit, then the second effect related to the tilt of the Earth's axis would result in solar days, at the solstices being 40 seconds longer than solar days at the equinoxes. And, uh, of course, both of these effects combine with each other, resulting in a specific deviation on any given day of the year. And now it is convenient for us to use uh, such a fiction as the mean solar day such that all these days are the same. And it is according to these days that we live, our clocks run. These days are divided into 24 hours, hours. Then into minutes, into seconds. And uh, both of these effects, separately and in total, respectively, lead to the fact that the actual solar day on a given day of the year turns out to be shorter than the mean solar day, or conversely longer than them. And these differences between the true solar days, which throughout the year become either shorter or longer, and the mean solar days, which are all the same, lead to the fact that true solar time and mean solar time diverge from each other. And this divergence can reach up to 15 minutes. What does this mean? That according to mean solar time, it is now noon. But it turns out that the sun has not yet reached the meridian it is lagging behind. Or conversely, it has already crossed the meridian. It is ahead on, of mean time. Well, this is the difference in time. It is called the equation of time. Here, the word equation is used in the old medieval sense as in equalization, how much this correction needs to be applied. And thus, they speak of the equation of time. And they illustrated a graph. And we will now take a look at this graph. The green line here shows the difference between true solar time and mean solar time, arising from the ellipticity of Earth's orbit. The red line shows the same difference, arising from the tilt of Earth's axis. And the blue line represents the sum of these two vectors. And it is precisely, although this graph, shown here by the blue line, that is called the equation of time graph. And now it's time for our final question. 
which will be dedicated to this image that astronomers call the solar analemma. How did it come about? A photographer took pictures of the sun's position at the same time according to his clock throughout the year and then combined all these photographs into one. And we see that the sun traced a sort of figure eight in the sky. And uh, recalling what I mentioned in this video, you can try to explain why the sun traces this figure eight. Write your thoughts on this matter in the comments on our YouTube video.